Hi, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be at this symposium to celebrate JC's achievements. JC, congratulations for receiving the Human Rights Award. JC and I started at Central South University. We overlapped in 1981 and 1982. I do not know whether we met each other on campus during that time, but I do know that we met each other in 1997 in Florida at the Catholic Conference. Here's JC with a yellow shirt. I want to thank JC for many years collaborations since we came to, came to the United States. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the work I do, which is closely related to what JC has been working on. The title of my presentation is Computational Thermodynamics and Its Applications. My name is Zeke Liu from Penn State University. Here is our group website. And on this slide, it shows 14 properties, which was compiled by JC about 20 years ago. And these properties are color coded. And the green ones are the fully developed through the high throughput experiment tools. Where the red ones were not developed yet, and the blue ones are partially developed. Let's look at what happens. What are, what are the situations now for after 20 years? As you can see here, there are three more of them are now green, and the wow, one more in blue. And as you can see, the thermal conductivity and the thermal expansion coefficient were developed by JC through high super experimentation. This slide shows JC's excellence. With this division multiples, you have the binaries, ternaries, and quaternaries. And the right diagram here shows the heat capacity measurement equipment, JC and his colleague has developed. So let's think about what really materials properties are. Well, it's, it represent, or materials properties represented the responses of a material to external stimuli. For example, heat, the thermal, and the work, mechanical, electrical, magnetic, and also chemical. If you think about this one, you probably realize that they are related to derivatives of free energy with respect to the external variables. When you talk about free energy, of course, you will you are, you are, you are think about thermodynamics, which is the science concerning the state of a system and how to respond to the uh, surroundings when do the interaction with the surroundings. The state can be stable, metastable, or even unstable. So last year in 2020, I, I wrote an overview paper published in ACTMAT to review what a computational thermodynamics has been and what applications it has been applied to. And in this paper, I focus on three areas. The first one is the conventional uh, thermodynamical topics like stability, metastability, and instability. The second one is on these kinetical coefficients, usually uh, separated from the thermodynamics. But I want to show you that actually they're part of thermodynamics because they are concerned they concern the properties, uh, the, the state of the system. And the last one I talk about in the paper is the mechanical properties. Again, it's also related to the energy of, this, of a system at the different states. So 
so this this comes to a question which you, uh, people usually ask: Is thermodynamics for equilibrium only, or they will say, or, or they, they would say, thermodynamics is for equilibrium only? Well, the answer actually is not that simple. If you look at the first law, which left as the internal energy, the right side is the heat, work, and the chemical, the three energies from outside, or the exchange between the system and the surroundings. If you look at this equation, it doesn't say whether the system should be equilibrium or not. It just says that if the exchange, the, the, the energy conservation. So it doesn't say should it be stable or not. But if you look at this equation, which is the one we commonly see in the textbooks of thermodynamics, this equation is for equilibrium only. So what's missing between two equations? Why it changes from the non-equilibrium, from a non any, any, any system to a system at equilibrium? That's because when Gibbs discussed the thermodynamics, he focused on the equilibrium. He dropped the term for the second law with a d dxi in this equation, which means is that at equilibrium, this term is equal to zero. So it goes back to uh, the, the equation above. That means it's for equilibrium only. Of course, if we want to apply to non-equilibrium systems or, or systems at any condition, we have to keep the last term. If we change it to Gibbs energy, the term is the same, is, is kept there, is d takes i. So that means the Gibbs energy should be a function of temperature, pressure, composition, and psi. So what is really psi then? Psi is the internal state of variables. So it defines the internal state. So if the inter internal state is at equilibrium, then psi becomes a dependent variable. Is a function of temperature, pressure, and uh, composition. If the system is not at equilibrium, then psi is an independent variable or variables because you could have uh, so many variables to describe the internal state. Let's give you examples about the internal variables. The one example, one example is the BCC copper. We know that BCC copper is FCC. But however, when copper forms a solution with BCC ion it form, uh, to form a BCC solid solution, then we have to get the BCC, the Gibbs energy of copper in BCC, the non-stable light structure for BCC, for copper. So that's the example. Of course, we can, we can uh, define the energy of the BCC copper in terms of FCC with a data G. That there is just called the lattice stability. There are a lot of other examples, of ordering, right? You talk about the, uh, the, the ordering, the, the, the elements go to different sub lattices, like for example, L12 ordering. Polarization, you get a magnetic spin ordering, you can get an electric dipole ordering, so they form different configurations. Defects, vacancies, dislocations, twins, stacking force, green boundaries, face interface surfaces. They're all internal variables. You don't directly control from outside. Okay. But of course, they're influenced uh, by the variables from outside. So that means we really should define a general a, a, a free energy. This, this is why you can say temperature, stress, magnetic, electric, and internal variable. If we write this, if we write this uh, a combined law for this general free energy, you can see that we have five terms plus three terms for the Ds, okay? In the previous equations, we only had a D, one, uh, the linear term, but we could have the high order terms too, okay? All these high order terms play important role, important roles in, in the behavior of the system. So if we plot, the, if we schematic part of one the dimensional diagram with one internal variable, then you can see that the energy has function of psi. Now you can define metastable. You have a metastable here. 
you put my cursor on here. You can metastable, you get a stable. And in both cases, D2 is larger than zero, is stable. That's what defines stability. And also when D2 becomes zero, you got an inflection points and inside it, this range and the system is unstable. Okay. Now, if D, D2, D3 all equal zero, then you become a critical point. So CAFAD is about modeling this properties. So what does it do? Why you the model properties of individual faces? Now, individual faces itself is an internal degree of freedom, right? Because the system could be, at the equilibrium may have multiple faces, but if you want to say, okay, I want just one face, that's the individual face property. So for that individual for that individual phase, you still have function of temperature, pressure, composition, and another degree of freedom, like the defects we mentioned, like it's ordering inside of that phase. So CAFED has a community. It has a, a annual conference. It has a private foundation, which back up financially back up the, back, uh, backs up the conference, and also scholarships and the awards. And they have a journal also published in 19, since 1977. And the, the Catholic community created a number of tools, or it's still creating uh, tools. And some of them are reviewed in this uh, uh, Catholic, jo Catholic journal, volume 26, issue number two. And you can see there are some commercial ones, SOMOCAC, FactSage, CompuSum, Pandad, GMATPRO, MATACAC, and a number of other ones. And it's also in recent years, there are some open source ones, open CAFAD, so, uh, Somochemica, and also the PACAF and SPA from our group for high throughput CAFAD modeling with uncertain quantification. Now you see that uh, JC and I will have now more collaborations because he has he's developing high throughput experiments and we are developing high throughput CAFAD modeling. And the CAFAD supports the SME and MGI activity initiatives. For example, in the ICME report 2008, it, uh, it, it wrote, CAFAD software is arguably the most important and perhaps the only generic tool available for ICME practitioners. And also for the uh, material genome initi initiative in 2011. And, and uh, as, as you can see, as I cited two papers here to talk about the connection, connections between the CAFAD and the material genome. One is by Greg Olson and the materials of genomics from CAFAD to flight. And also one of my paper, both published in 2014, on perspective on materials of genome. So CAFAD modeling, as I just mentioned, is about the individual faces. It models the Gibbs energy function, Gibbs energy of individual faces as a function of internal variables. For the any modeling with the input data, so we take the derivatives of the Gibbs energy the first and the second derivatives. In principle, that, that those data should be enough to generate the Gibbs energy of individual phases. However, because those, va those, va those the value input data, they have a large uncertainty because they match from heat. So to use the Gibbs energy functions to predict the phase equilibrium has a large error. So that, that, that's why you need the phase boundary data, your phase equilibrium that refines the, uh, the model parameters. That's what a CAFAD is about. So taking both sets of data, they, can, they, they come from the same origin. Yeah. Then to develop a, a internally consistent uh, for energy functions for all phases. And we start with the pure elements, go to binary, turn a multi-component system. So I assume as you have those uh, Gibbs energy functions, then you can do the material design. You can calculate equilibrium. You can calculate driving forces. You can even more important, you can calculate the properties by the first and second derivatives. So in early days, the model, cavity modeling uh, was done, was, was uh, rely on, relied on most, mo many experiment data and estimations. And about 20 years ago, there are a lot of first, first principles calculations became available. First principle calculations, calculations were mostly for zero Kelvin. That's here today. Most of the calculations are for zero Kelvin. But if you take statistical mechanics, calculate phonon properties, you can get a finite temperature property uh, data. 
And in this case, you see that experiment get equilibrium data. First principles can then get equilibrium or non equilibrium data. Then put together, the developer model is much more robust and then has better predictability of the database. Okay, so to continue to develop, develop those tools, we need to get a high throughput and also with uncertain qualifications. So over the years, as our, my group at Penn State, I have been developing a number of tools. First one is for data generation. And we have developed a machine learning code to predict the formation energy at zero Kelvin. We also developed a, a DFT toolkit to calculate free energy of a given configuration. And then we developed the, the software, uh, high throughput tools for data processing, for, for equilibrium calculations and for evaluated model parameters. And then we collaborated with uh, a scientist at the Oregon National Lab to develop another code called PDAC for the uncertain quantification with the inputs from SBay and PACIFA. And all these tools are open source, as you can, you can see from the GitHub here, or you can go to the, our individual website to download the code, to install the code. To further make the community a, use the tools, we will form the materials, nonprofit material genome foundation to give workshop, to, to present workshops. And we had two last year. And we, rec the recording of the workshops uh, are, pre are available on YouTube channel. Okay, our idea is really to create this, uh, I call it ocean of data. So integrating first principle calculations and the kind of modeling with machine learning. Okay. And I, want, I do want to mention that uh, the, the slide I showed before on this uh, first principle and the CAFA integration, and the paper was published in 2009, uh, was given at a, a symposium organized by JC in 2008. And JC encouraged me to write, uh, to, to write the paper, to, to summarize what we did. So that was a paper in 2009. And then 10 years later, uh, JC organized another symposium and I gave a talk. He said, I should have put this, my talk into another paper. So it comes, uh, here it is, it's ocean of, ocean of data. The idea is really that they, we have to kind of, uh, you know, uh, the data and the tool come together to develop a data ecosystem, which database can be continuously improved. So the philosophy is really behave like, a, like, behave like an ecosystem in nature. Okay. You take all the data from different lakes and, and they're connected by the rivers, or you take some, you know, the secret data, also, but you combine them together and use the tools, high school tools to generate database, then put, you can be used for more applications and generate more data. So that's what I, we call the data, an ocean of data and the data ecosystem. We take a theoretical data, theoretical predictions and experiment uh, measurements, and this creates a proto data, okay? That's our original data here. And then we're going to use this, uh, a, a use this uh, proto data and with a high super tools to develop a CAFA databases. And then it can do material design and uh, mix material and uh, use the material, get new data. So this new data will fit into the proto database, database system and then refine the data. And of course, we, we have to also do recycle material. And at the same time, we get more data from this material recycle. And then put in, in them into the portal data and expand it and refine the, the process data, a work at a CAFA database. So what, are, what type of properties we're talking about here then? Okay, let's take this derivatives. As I mentioned, the properties are derivatives. So derivatives between the molar quantity and the potentials. That's what we have for the Gibbs energy, right? So gives it to potential derivative, okay? So the first derivative gives the entropy to temperature gives the entropy. Then second, second derivative to temperature gives the heat capacity. So all the properties in the middle here are the second derivatives of the free energy to potentials. We have now four potentials here, temperature, stress, 
electrical field and the magnetic field. So this uh, set of uh, properties are what we usually measure. We measure heat capacity, as uh, JC mentioned, measure heat thermal expansion, okay, and all those properties. So it's interesting question. They look at this table. We talk about the sign of the properties. So the properties may be negative, or maybe positive, right? But we know that the diagonal to diagonal properties they are positive when the system is stable. That's stability requirement. However, for the off diagonal terms properties, they could be we don't know, right? We don't know because the law we have no laws to govern them. That means you know when when no law, that is they're going to do everything you want, right? Could be positive, negative, or course, zero. Okay, I just showed you that one for the negative sum expansion or zero sum expansion in the ion ecosystem. And even more important, at the critical point, that's the limit of stability. And all the properties will become infinite. That the, the, in this uh, in this table, okay. But it, again, because some could be positive or negative, right? So it could be positive infinity or negative infinity. So now we need to get the prop. This is a, for zero Kelvin, we get the data. Now we get a pro property at finite temperatures. Okay, you can do the quasi harmonic calculations for, for, from for first principles. So you calculate the entropy. So how do we represent entropy? It's actually by the vibration frequency, vibrational frequency, phonon frequencies. So you calculate all the phonon frequencies, you put them back together, use partition function. That's the partition function approach at the phonon scale. Then you get the entropy. Now let's think about this one, right? At high temperature, we can have a lot of different configurations competing with each other. So it's not only phonon frequencies anymore. You get a lot of the configurations combined together. So I, we use this one, we call it a partition function at the larger scales. In, in my paper, section 2.4.2 and 5.3, we'll talk about the fundamentals. We talk about the uh, applications. So that means, in it, that means this, at a scale above the phonon, you have the atomic arrangement, that's a short range ordering. A long a short range ordering, you can have spin ordering, you can have the electric polarization ordering, you have defects, interfaces, it's all the precise, right? But that's all above the phonon scale. So phonon cannot capture them. Okay, Can, cannot capture them. And then you talk about the a, so if you want to do this calculation, our approach is that we calculate each configuration with this the quasi harmonic phonon approach. Okay. Then we do statistical mixture of the configurations at the scale which we are interested. And it, with this approach, we can predict the sign of these uh, properties as I showed you in the previous slide, whether it's positive or negative or zero, or the divergence at the, uh, at the critical point. Think about this one the divergence at the critical point is the largest harmonicity you can get because it goes infinite. So with this approach, we can predict all the properties at the finite temperatures. It's much more uh, uh, beyond the quasi harmonic approach. Okay, so now we talk about these properties, right? It's between the potentials and the, the molar quantities, derivatives, okay? But think about this one, we have another quantity, right? We have the Gibbs energy, we have the mass. Then we have chemical potential here. So then we can get the divide between the potentials. Okay, so we talk about the chemical potential to temperature gradient, chemical potential to the stress. So what is this one? There's thermal transport. Because when you change temperature, you can change chemical potential, you're gonna drive diffusion. That's thermal transport. Or the diffusion can be driven by stress or by the electric migration or by the magnetic migration. And what do we call this one? We call this cross phenomena. It's a cross phenomena. I mean, two potentials interact with each other, okay, driving the, the process. In this case, it's driving diffusion, right? It's all diffusion because chemical potential, chemical potential is a driving force, driving diffusion. Other cross phenomena 
other potentials affect the chemical potential through the cross, uh, cross phenomena. So there's a wide range of cross phenomena here. Okay, this is all for diffusion, like all for diffusion. And the last one is the cross diffusion effect, right? That's because, for example, we know that for the RPO diffusion, silicon affects the uh, carbon uh, chemical potential a lot. Okay, so this become a cross diffusion between the elements here. The one of them we have been lately working on is really the C by coefficient. So C by coefficient, uh, now we, we have to think about the component. Usually we think about chemical component, but the electron, an electron is not component, right? So electron is not component. So electron has elect, elect, electron chemical potential. So that chemical potential can be affected by temperature. So that's what you get CPAC coefficient. So we actually believe that the, 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 the CPAC coefficient is a thermodynamic property, is the effect of temperature on the chemical potential of electron. If you use Maxwell relation, it means it's partial entropy of elect electrons. All right, so we do, I have a few slides really want to elaborate this one because we, I think this is a fundamental new set of properties connected to the derivatives and it can be calculated through the Maxwell relations. So let's think about uh, the, the diffusion of electron. Electron migration is driven by its chemical potential. This chemical potential can be uh, affected by different way, different uh, uh, stimuli from outside, by stimuli from, from outside. You can, you can affect by the electrical potential or the magnetic field, right? We know that because if you add a magnetic field, the electron starts to move. If you add an electric field, st electron starts to move. Or you have a temperature, it starts to move too. But we have to be very clear, the migration electron is driven by its chemical potential difference. It's not by temperature gradient. It's not about electrical field because it's just, oh, electric is okay because that directly affects the chemical potential. But it's chemical potential of electron, electron, which controls the diffusion. So that means the electric current is, can be written this way, is the chemical potential of electron gradient times the, uh, the charge divided by charge at times the electric conductivity. But a typical elect, electric, uh, 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 a typical equation for elect, elect, some electric material is written like this with two terms here. So why is the voltage and that's the temperature. So how these two come together? Well, you can symbolize this one. It just means this, that the, the, the gradient of chemical potential of ele electron is equal to two terms. It's affected by temperature. It's affected by the, uh, the, the voltage. So what, what are the terms of voltage? Well, is the electron, dens electron density. Okay, so you now can see that the voltage difference is actually the gradient of the electron density. Now I can see that there's some, there, there's some uh, Cibet coefficient is the partial derivative, partial entropy of the elect electrons. Of course, then we can calculate, because now from the first principle we can calculate. We can calculate the, uh, the electron density. So here is shown here is the electron density of states for a, a lead terrenite. Okay, this, this is the frame level. So now I can see that you can P doping on this side. So the frame level, frame level will move to the, this side. If it's undoped, the frame level will move to this side. Okay, that's a zero Kelvin. Now, when temperature goes up, temperature goes up, the, the E dos is going to change. In this, in the p-doping case, it's going to move to high to higher energy, okay. And in the n type of case, it's going to move lower energy. So is this chemical potential integration will give us the 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 the, the chemical potential, and then it can use the calculate chemical potential. Then for this temperature dependence, you can calculate the Cb coefficient. So that's what we did. So this let the time right. And you can see that there's a symbols of experiments. The calculations, uh, the, the lines are from our calculations. The dashed lines, uh, this is for different, uh, uh, different dopants, uh, different dopants, okay? You have a solid line and dashed line for different, uh, different level of a doping, doping level. The agreement is fantastic. 
But I have realized this is a purely prediction. It's from electronic structure calculation, from electric density of states. And the distribution of the function of temperature. There's a tin satellite. Again, you can see that the agreement with experiments, it's a fantastic. It's fantastic. Okay. And also we did compare with the Bozeman method here too. Okay, Bozeman method. A, a Bozeman trapping method that people did in the literature. We compare with our data. Okay. So I do want to show that you can see this too. Okay. I Oh, it's 19 here. It's 19 here, right? So then the, the dashed line, the dot dashed line is our simulation. The dashed line is the, the simulation from the Bozeman, trapper me Bozeman transport method. As you can see, that our data actually agree better with the experiment. You can also do another stage. Well, now you can change the chemistry of the material. So this is a different uh, amount of uh, lanthanum, terrenite. So 2.67 to 4, 2.75 to 4, and 3 to 4. Of course, now you move the uh, Fermi level at different locations on the EDOS. And then you can calculate the, uh, the different CPI uh, coefficient and compare with experiments. Of course, it's, it's the calculation is not easy because you have to be very careful about the uh, very high uh, uh, accuracy calculation for the electron uh, density of states. But it demonstrated that a CPI coefficient is, is, is a thermodynamic property. It's a derivatives, is a derivative between the two potentials, is a chemical potential of electron to temperature derivative. This open a, open a, 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 a option, open possibilities to calculate so many different properties. Okay. So there's a lot more we can calculate now. That's all related to the cross effect, cross phenomena. For example, we, we talked about this one before, right? Only one row, one row here, okay? Now, if we change all of them to potentials, now you see we got the, a lot of different properties here. And it, because of the a Maxwell relation, this, this is symmetric, right? Symmetric. Because second order, second order derivatives of the free energy. So you can see that the blue ones are between the potentials, and the black ones are between the molar quantities. And uh, experimentally, it's easy to measure this one. But computationally, it's, it's easier to predict them, to calculate them. So this is a really perfect, the Maxwell relation is a perfect integration of the experiment and the computation. Now, I, I hope JC is excited, just as I am. And now we are going to, JC and I are going to work even more in the future, okay? There's a measurement and a computation. And then these two together will be very efficient, very efficiently to generate a lot of data, data, okay? Which were difficult to measure and difficult to calculate before. That this is open a completely new playground, a playground, playground for us to get all these properties. Okay. Uh, uh, when I mentioned at the beginning, in my overview paper, we did talk about the mechanical properties, right? But I didn't have time to go through all, all of them, but I do want to list a few properties we calculated. And I think there's a lot of more of them uh, can be calculated. Uh, we just got a project from uh, APAE, hope to calculate more properties. And also uh, at the same time, develop a high throughput method. It's just like JC do experiments, high throughput experimentations, we want to do more high throughput calculations. So uh, back in 14, 14 uh, 15 years ago, we started the elastic constant calculations as for the alumina. And then we calculate the elastic constant as function of temperature, as the tensors, el elastic uh, property tensors. And then we moved to the, to the next one to the dislocations. We work with uh, Dallas Twinkle, Get help from him to calculate the dislocation core structures and the kinker formation and the migrations. And uh, when we can predict that they uh, uh, combine with the, with the mechanistic models, we can actually predict a stress strain curve. Okay, so we demonstrated these two papers and the later extended further about the dislocation properties uh, uh, in uh, 2019. We also calculated the uh, uh, started the relative equilibrium 
property rate. And based on the properties we can predict, that's the uh, stack and fold energy, uh, dislocate, uh, dispute divisivity. Then we can predict the, uh, the relative equilibrium rate, basically the alloy elements effect, effect of alloy elements and the equilibrium property we did for FCC aluminum, FCC nickel in the paper. And then more recently, and uh, my colleague, Professor Alison Bees uh, in our department, and she's expert on the crystal plasticity simulation. So now we work together. Now we can predict the, uh, we, we can take the input from first principle calculations, basically for the ideal shear stress, ideal shear strength, and put it together to predict the straight string curve of single crystal for nickel. That's our paper. It's in the process to be published. And if, as a function of orientation. And we are now also modeled the, uh, the hardness. Most of the hardness models in the literature have the input data, the parameters are purely elastic. But we know that the hardness is about plastic deformation. So in this work, as one for uh, my former student, uh, Hong Yun Kim, he developed a hardness model with attributes from plastic deformation. Of course, also for an elastic one too. That one, that model he has can predict, uh, can uh, represent uh, uh, the hardness from very low one, like a pure aluminum, all the way to diamond with one equation and uh, with the uh, attributes, including both elastic and plastic uh, properties. All right, with that one, I want to uh, summarize uh, my presentation. I hope I convinced you the combined law of thermodynamics is for equilibrium and the long equilibrium states of system. First principle calculations enables high throughput cathode modeling of thermodynamics with new tools continuously being developed. I hope some of you will join uh, to develop, uh, join us to develop the pack of the SP uh, as open source code. I want to mention that pack of in pack of you can develop your own model, any type of model for, for, for any properties you want to develop. And you can still use the same computer engine uh, to, to model your properties. And the SP provides the high throughput functionality and uncertainty quantification. And the properties of individual phase at the finite temperatures can be predicted by the partition function approach of configurations of first action should be phonal and the configurations including singularity at a critical point. Those, co co those configurations are the building blocks of individual phases. We call it, we should call it genome, gen, material genome. The largely overlooked the derivatives between potentials provided new capabilities to provide coefficients for cross phenomena. As a wide range of uh, properties, people typically consider them as kinetic properties. Again, congratulations, JC. Looks like I do have one minute left in my time. So I'm going to uh, just show that the why material genome is important, okay? I, 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 I coined this term back in 2002. It's really inspired by the Human Genome Project. Okay, Human Genome was talking about the uh, map of the genes of 20, around 20,000 human genes, human, gene, human, human, human genome. But inside these 20,000 uh, genes, they have uh, three billions of uh, base pairs. Okay, so what it means is that. So even though uh, we only have 20,000 of genes, but inside each gene, each genes have different lengths. They have a lot of those chemical pairs. And uh, these chemical pairs, their arrangement in space dictates the properties. So what does it mean? That means uh, each gene has a function. It has 10 to the third to 10 to the sixth power of the uh, base pairs. And they combine together from the DNA, then from the structure, okay? Structure has now four orders of magnitude. Uh, base pairs. 
Now, if we think about this, genes are the faces we have. The face gives the properties, which got functions we have. And then the microstructure is more like all the genes come together. But the question, of course, is that what are the base pairs for a face? How many are they? Okay. So now, if you, if you follow uh, my thoughts, that I mean, those uh, base pairs based on the configurations in a phase. Uh, how many are there? If you do the estimation, it's probably close to the ratio between the genes and the base pairs, 10 to the fifth or 10 to the seventh power, the ratio is. All right, with that one, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>